Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Ulf Danielson. A prize-winning physicist, uh, he has a PhD from Princeton. His research concentrates on dark energy and string theory with a special focus on applications in cosmology. He's a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He's the professor of theoretical physics at Uppsala University. He's delivered lectures throughout the world based on his award-winning, as I said, popular science books, which have been translated into several languages. The World Itself, today's book, Consciousness and the Everything of Physics, was published by Bellevue just last week. It is his first book to appear in English. Hopefully, there'll be many more to come. So how can anyone see an illusory entity, especially the entity itself, as Cicero said? So what is this entity we're in? Is it governed by a, a concrete external reality that actually exists out there, independent of our own consciousness? If you say yes, it makes life a lot easier, at least to me. And if you say no, and then you scrape your chin on the leg of the table, you may have made a crucial error in judgment. You know, are there platonic ideals such as truth and beauty and what we perceive as lowly organisms as simply flickering shapes on a wall of a cave? You know, and then are the mind and the brain one or two? Was Descartes a seer or was he full of shit? You know, and as David... Chalmers posits, are there a bunch of zombies out there imitating and convincing us that consciousness is true and in actuality, it is the construct. As David Byrne said, you know, is this my beautiful wife? Does mathematics control our universe or, or does it just give us a tool to recognize that it actually doesn't control our universe? Basically, when Pinocchio says his nose will grow, is he lying or telling the truth? So do we inhabit a self-referential world? And, and did Bertrand Russell really break his mind trying to prove the simplest of arithmetic equations only to fail miserably because of Hilbert, Goodell, others whose shoulders we stand on as they stood on Newton's? So how the hell should I know if I am, I am? But Ulf will explain all of this. Because <laughs> Because maybe he knows the answer. So welcome, Wolf, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I think you summed up many of the things which are in my book, actually. Yeah, well, your book was great. And the reason I remember is because it was a really good book. You, as a bookseller, um, I, uh, my way of understanding whether a book is a good book is in a novel, you remember the characters' names. And in a book like this, you remember the people you talked about and your own opinions, which are very artfully and, and uh, articulately expressed. And, you're, and you. Go, you know, going backwards, in your acknowledgments, you thank David Chalmers, who I mentioned, and I interviewed him almost to the day, a year ago on his latest book, Reality Plus. And then you also thank Douglas Hofstetter, who you were lucky enough to have conversations with, for which I am envious, <laughs> my hero. But they, they seem to differ, and maybe that's a good way to start, because you seem to speak so highly of them, but then, and you know, it's fine. They seem to differ with a lot of what you say in the book, right? I, I think that's correct, yes. So my point of view is is a little bit different and, and I think quite different also from how physics, I mean, I'm, phys I'm a physicist. I'm trying to, to apply what I've learned in physics to, to, to create a kind of a worldview. I mean, this is, book is a, is a kind of a summary of, the, of my view of the world. But even though I'm very interested in mathematics and I love theoretical physics, that is what I do. I still think I have a slightly different angle to what the world actually is. And in particular, I think it has to do with my view of mathematics, what mathematics actually is. And uh, Max Tegmark is a, is a friend of mine. I've discussed with him a lot. 
has a completely different opinion of what mathematics is. I mean, he wrote a book with the title The Mathematical Universe. And you might think that since I'm a theoretical physicist, my job is to construct laws of physics that describe something real out there. You would think that I also thought that you, the universe is somehow basically mathematics, but I don't think that at all. To me, and I think honestly, I think that most people who are not physicists Mathematics is a tool. It's not that it's the universe is mathematical or the universe is governed by laws of mathematical laws. It's actually just the other way around. The universe does what it does. And then we try by using mathematics to construct models that are supposed to mimic what the universe does. So my point of view is quite the opposite in a sense. And while I think that many other people like Max Tegmark and I think also actually Douglas Hofstadter think that mathematics is much more fundamental to the way the world is. And, and I think that's, that's one of the most important messages that I will get, want to get through with the book that we have a real world of flesh and blood matter which we are a part of, and mathematics is just sitting inside our heads, basically. Well, you say, and, and I'm quoting, you say, I'm a realist, I sincerely believe that the world in, exists independently of my own existence, and there are truths yes. about the world that I can try to reveal. Some of what I already think I know, I'm convinced yes. correct. But what you say is, I sincerely believe, and I do believe that you sincerely believe, Yes. Is that ontological? Is it empirical? Your, your sincere belief is not enough for me, right? No, no in a sense. The, the, the only thing I can do, I can, what I can do is clearly as a physicist, I can try to give you rational arguments. I can point to empirical evidence for various things, but then I can also, as a human being, tell you what kind of conclusions I have drawn from this, conclusions which are very important to me and they carry sort of an ontological meaning to me. And then I can, I can present that to you and then you can take it to leave it in a sense. I well, cannot give you a rational definite proof for that I am right in all of this, but uh, I, can, I can present the argument and then I hope that many people will come along and adhere to that worldview. What you say can't be proved and it can't be disproved, but I've been lucky enough to interview neurologists, neuroscientists, biologists, cosmologists, quantum physicists, philosophers, yes. authors, <laughs> and I have irritated them because I say, okay, what if this is just a solipsistic world? One of us is talking, but, and then you can't disprove that either. Uh, that, that, I, that's that, that, that's that's ab absolutely true, but I think that that's that's really a fact of, of the human existence. That there are many things that we will not be able to really prove. I mean, I as a physicist and a scientist, I'm in some sense, I'm obviously advocating that one should use rational arguments. One should find empirical proof and all of that. But I would be dishonest if I would say that everything can be proven in that sense. That, that's simply not the way it is. And much of that is also due to another very important uh, message that I try to convey in the book. And that is that we are not these independent, again, this is my belief, but Still, we are not this kind of independent entities, independent of the organic physical world, which is flying around and then from an objective point of view observes everything. That is not how it is. I think that one of the most important messages of science, which is not really appreciated, is that we are part of the world as the organic living beings that we are, which means that oral knowledge everything is filtered, not only, only through our organic senses, but also through our organic brain. So everything that we know 
is dependent upon the physical organism that we are. And clearly that means that we that we are that not everything that can be known and understood can be known and understood by us. That's sort of just because of our physical limitations. And that's something that one also need to keep in mind if one have sort of two high standards for what what is true and what is sure and so on. Well, what if we take what is your real day job, string theory, and I ask you, can you experimentally prove string theory? Okay, okay. Now, now we are coming to questions which are a lot simpler than the questions that we just discussed, because now we are talking about really very, very precise physical science. And then we go back in time, obviously there were a lot of crazy theories like relativity and quantum mechanics, which of course turned out to be observationally, experimentally uh, confirmed. In effect, they were devol developed together with, with empirical input. And, and we have developed modern physics, which we use as a tool to understand and, and manipulate even the world. For me, string theory is just the same. It's just that we are in a very preliminary situation at the moment. We have big questions, how to understand on, in a mathematical sense, the laws of physics, which so far we have been able to establish like quantum mechanics and relativity. And then there are inconsistencies when we try to put them together. There are also various, even observational evidence that are things we don't know about the world, very basic things like dark energy and dark matter and whatever. I, as a string theorist, I try to find new theoretical models, which are supposed to solve the mathematical problems, explain things we don't understand at the moment, and actually give new predictions, which can be verified in the future. So for me, string theory is no different from theories in the past. It's just that we haven't been able to test it yet. And in fact, what could happen is that the predictions eventually which comes out of string theory might turn out to be wrong. And that proves that it was a, a real theory of physics because it could be proven wrong. Wonderful. So, so in fact, I, I don't think that string theory is too different from, from other parts of physics. It's just that we don't know as yet whether it's correct or not. Some of the book is funny, and the funniest thing to me was the one, and this goes directly to what you're saying, is the, theor <laughs> the theorists and the experimentalists climbing in the mountains, and the theorist looks <laughs> at the map when they get lost. <laughs> he goes, ah, we're exactly over there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a quote from Leon Lederman, a Nobel, Nobel laureate in physics. Yeah, I liked it a lot when I first heard it. And I think that you need to have some kind of... Uh, be a little bit humble in that sense and realize that you can make mistakes. And I, I think that's, that's good for, for even for theoretical physicists to keep in mind. Yeah, and and that, that's sort of a quote that reminds me about, okay, let's be a little bit careful. Yeah, I, <laughs> and I think the humor, and I think always looking at this with a sense of humor really helps. Not only does it draw you so. along yes. in your path and in the book, but, so then the, 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 the other interesting thing about this book is you can come at it from almost anything that you've ever thought in your life. So when I was reading it, I thought, okay, Einstein and the cosmological constant. And then he goes, it's the greatest blunder of my life. And I always felt bad for him because <laughs> it wasn't, no. depending on who you listen to. No. And it's like, okay, well, so for a while... It was the greatest blunder of his life. So that's, is that the concrete reality? And then all of a sudden it becomes, oh yeah, there's 95% dark matter and dark energy. Thanks a lot. You didn't make a mistake. No, 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 no. I can't remember. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, it, to, to, to explain it in, even, in somewhat more detail, what could have been his blunder was actually that he thought that he, with the help of what we now call dark energy, could achieve a stable universe that didn't evolve in time. 
that was a sort of a little mathematical mistake he made. But that was just that he was so keen to, to represent the universe in the way they thought it was at that time. Then, of course, it was discovered that universe expands, and then the that use of the cosmological constant of dark energy was not important anymore. But then, of course, now we have discovered that this feature that Einstein discovered in his equations, the cosmological constant of dark energy, is in fact so important. So, in fact, as you, as you indicate, this is probably one of his most important discoveries and shouldn't be called a blunder. Absolutely. Yeah, well, you know, it was static and now it's expanding, a, accelerating its expansion. But, okay, and then the other thing, the other way you can come at this is every, every guy, every person who, who's interested in this concept loves Schrodinger's cat. There's not one. <laughs> Why does everyone love that cat? And what is so important about the collapse of wave function? And you come at it with a completely different viewpoint than most of the people I've talked to. Yeah, of course. I mean, the the thing with Schrodinger's cat is, of course, that it makes it makes physics suddenly relevant to 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 us in a sense. Uh, it, it, it it reminds us that that we are living in a in a real physical world, and all of these things that we that all of these difficult things somehow have to have a, a relevance to to the real world that we are living in as well. So I think it's a it's it's a beautiful thought experiment. Absolutely. Well, then, if the wave function does in fact collapse upon observation, your view of reality, and I may be completely wrong, is that the tree falls and it makes the sound whether you're there or not. Yeah, I think the, that the, the, the most important message again in the book, and it hasn't just to do with quantum mechanics, it has to do with physics in general, is that uh, the world is for real. It's a very strange world. And uh, many of the things which exist and we can observe are very, very, I mean, it's, it's 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 not things that we usually are familiar in our daily life. I mean, there are there are things that you need to have very careful equipment to be able to observe, but it's a, it's a real physical world out there. And then we have tools that we use to describe what we see and make predictions. And of course, quantum mechanics is such a such a tool. But since it deals with phenomena that we really lack uh, direct experience with, we can easily misinterpret what the model is actually telling us. And there is this risk that we identify the model with the world itself and do not see that it's a real, that it's just a tool that we use to make predictions, a tool which easily might have deficiencies and the real world might differ in many ways. And I think quantum mechanics is, invites you to interpret its results in many different ways. And in particular, if you take its mat mathematical content really seriously, in fact, too seriously, then you can be misled into think that the world is very different from you have any sensible reason to believe. And in fact, this is, of course, what connects to the, the concept of parallel worlds. It's a, it's a very, in the popular culture and maybe in science fiction stories and, and maybe by some philosophers, it's a very popular way to interpret quantum mechanics where you say that, okay, you have this uh, ingredient of chance in quantum mechanics. You don't know what, what will happen. And then the, the parallel world interpretation of quantum mechanics, it says that, well, everything happens 
in every moment, the world splits off in different alternative histories, which exist parallel to each other. And this is an interpretation of quantum mechanics, which goes back to the 50s, which have some, there are some advantages with it. You can use it some, sometimes to, to understand some of the mathematical aspects of quantum mechanics. It's, it's not just something that someone cooked up without any, any real mathematical reason, but it's, it's, so it can be useful to some extent. But my problem is that many people who are also writing about quantum mechanics in, in, in popular context of popular science really want to promote it as the interpretation of quantum mechanics because it's so entertaining. It really is because it's something that you, well, this, this is so difficult. We, we cannot really understand it. It's so fascinating and you can make great movies, which is really based on this kind of idea. But to me, it doesn't really, there's really no reason whatsoever to believe that this is actually true. Again, I cannot prove it to you that this interpretation is wrong, but I don't see any real reason for doing it because I think this is an example of, again, the mistake where you identify the world with the mathematical models of a theoretical physicist, and then you you take the you, you take it simply too 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 far. If you instead just keep in mind what physics and the laws we construct are supposed to do, that is to give correct predictions of actual experiments. That's what you need. And from that point of view, there is no reason to make this assumption of parallel worlds. Quantum mechanics works and can be experimentally tested without taking that idea to heart. And um, so from that point of view, I might, I might have a kind of a boring attitude to, to everything. I, I try to say that don't, don't, don't believe that. It's, it's just crazy, it's unnecessary. And some people might get, get a little bit oh, depressed. I mean, can't we believe and dream about these things? They are so fascinating, but I, I don't think it's really honest to do that. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned cultural references and you know there's this american movie now everything everywhere all at once everything everywhere all at once and it's <laughs> like, you know, the idea of someone's pointing a gun at you and they pull the trigger theoretically you should be dead but you're not because you're still there because your consciousness has shifted instantaneously to one of these infinite number of worlds and you talk yeah about you have to you have to end up in one of the worlds which you're actually living in and it's logical because you talk about nested infinities and you talk about yeah. integers. I mean, if if it's if it's true enough that you can't count from zero to one, but you can count one, two, three, four, five forever, why isn't it like why haven't we already split an infinite number of times? And it is fun to think about, but well, again, because of your book, there are so many things you can come at. What what about just let's just talk about the strong anthropic principle? If, if ice sunk instead of floated, none of us would be here. We wouldn't be here to be talking. A abso abso absolutely, that, that's, that's true. Even though if you, since you said strong, uh, that, well, I'm a, a proponent of the weak anthropic principle. There are differences there, but it's true that that's, that's another, okay, I think here we have to make an important distinction. Okay. Because there's the there's the multi multiverse and there's the parallel worlds. And as I just tried to explain, I'm not a believer of the parallel worlds or quantum mechanics. In fact, I think it's well, I explain why I don't think that is true, and it has to do with the wrong view of what models and mathematics are. On the other hand, the multiverse, that's a very different thing because that's just a kind of a geographic speculation of very old fashioned kind. I mean, if you go back a few hundred years, uh, we up in, 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 in Europe then speculated about whether there could be other continents. The Americas were discovered. And then of course, a lot of speculations about the big Southern continent and eventually Australia was discovered and, and so on. 
it's it's very natural to to speculate that the world is much bigger than what we actually see and the same is of course for our universe why couldn't there be something beyond the cosmic horizon and in fact there are also reasons if you believe in string theory or those parts of theoretical physics you could also imagine that what we call the laws of physics might be different in other places, in other geographical locations in this multiverse, which is much bigger than the universe that we're actually sitting in. And oh. here you then might find an explanation for a very strange fact of our universe. And that is that what we call the laws of nature seems to be so fine tuned for that to be not only life, but even stars. So then the explanation, which would be the weak anthropic principle is not that there is any intention for us to, to be here or anything like that. It's that, yes, that the universe is so big and there are so many possibilities that somewhere it's likely that the laws of physics are such that not only stars can form and planets, but also life and clearly it's that corner of the multiverse. That's where we have to exist. This is very similar, actually, to the explanation for why the Earth is such a friendly place to, to be at. It's not that there are any law of physics that tell you that this particular planet must have this distance to the sun and has to be, be water and, 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 and whatever is needed in order for us to be here. Now, the Earth could have been at any distance and any property. It's just that there are so many planets in the universe that at least a few of them should be hospitable to, to life. So it's just that idea which is just lifted to the level of the multiverse. So from that point of view, I think the multiverse is a natural speculation which have some theoretical foundation and it has sort of a good historical track record. The world is always bigger than you thought it were. Even though again, clearly I have no idea. I have no idea how big, big the universe is or whether it's much bigger than what we see. But I think at least that's something which makes sense to me, not just because of mathematics or anything like that, just because because I'm here and I, I, I see the world and I see that it's, it's much bigger than what I am. Yeah. The pattern of worlds, it's a different story. Yeah, you're the observer. But yeah. going back to, uh, it's interesting that you talked about the Southern continent, because that reminds me of Richard Feynman, which in that Nova series, where it's so great. And he's talking about, well, lots of things. But one thing he talks about is, you know, you study chess for years, and you're a hundred percent sure you know every single thing about chess, <laughs> and then someone castles. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I know that feeling again. I, I don't play chess very often. Obviously, every theoretical physicist is, of course, interested in playing chess and has done it once in a while. But I have this problem that I I get into uh, get these nice combinations, and you think that you're on top of everything, and then suddenly someone take your queen or something. I mean, you, you're you blind to the to the obvious things. So indeed, yes, I, I have the same feeling about chess. Well, it's funny because it's what, one of the things I admire about scientists is that when you fail, you're happy. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's actually true. That's actually true, yes. Even though it's not completely true. I mean, sometimes you get a little bit disappointed, but if you're a good design scientist, you can come back and actually make some, 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 some use of your failures. Absolutely. When I started out, I talked about Platonism and you start out talking about Platonism as well. And once again, you seem to disagree with a worldview based on Platonism. Absolutely. Again, to, to me, it's, it's really, it's based on my conviction that the mathematics and ideas are situated in our physical brains. And uh, the mathematics is a process, something which is happening inside here. 
the the world out there the universe doesn't need mathematics in order to make the planets move or whatever they just move but we are trying to represent all all of what happens using mathematics which is something that happens inside of our brains now that might give you the impression that i have a very narrow mechanistic view of what the world is that is very far from the case because i sincerely believe that uh, what goes goes on inside of our brains is not something that can be represented or understood in any way using our present knowledge of science natural science or physics I don't think it's a problem that a neuroscientist will be able to solve, not the biologist either. I really think that you need basic new knowledge about physics in order to do that. And uh, that has to do with this subjective inner awareness that we have, which to me, since I'm a naturalist, must be a natural phenomena, a physical phenomena, but a phenomena which clearly cannot be represented using the kind of physics that we know now. So you see that you can come at this uh, from two ends. I mean, if you want to judge my view of the world, on the one hand, you can find that it's very limited in the sense that, well, this, this world of ideas, I mean, these beautiful ideas, which are somehow outside of, the, of this poor material world, I say they don't exist. I say that everything is matter, everything is physics, everything is happening in here. But on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to convince you that that physical natural world is much more beautiful and fantastic that we might, than we might think if we just look at what physics and mathematics has taught us so far. And it's, in fact, it has room for all of these things that we find important for us humans, which includes this inner world, this mind, the world of the mind. You know, that leads me, you know, as again, as a bookseller, epigraphs are very important to me because the author obviously thinks about them for a long time because it's, a nomen of the actual book itself. It's a sundial that points to the chapter that that then begins. And and you, do, I had a problem with this because your epigraphs are great. So if you look at Du uh speech at the Nobel banquet, <laughs> yes. this is what you were talking about. He goes, "The world is very very large." I'm reading it. My head is small, quite small. It's impossible to put the world in my head. Nevertheless, we try to make some kind of representation in our body, which, okay, you begin the, the chapter with that, but then it seems like you disagree with that. Th that's not <laughs> made a mistake. It, am I wrong? I don't understand that. It seems, to, it, it seems to jive a little bit differently than what you're saying in the book, but you have it at the beginning of the chapter. Where am I wrong? No, I think, I, I think it's, it, it's consistent um, because I'm, what that epigraph is, telling us is of course that we are we are limited and we are trying to do us that represent the whole world in our minds and clearly we fail i'm i'm absolutely sure that there are very precise physical questions about the universe not necessarily things which have to do with well, could have to do with black holes or whatever or other physical phenomena that we will not be able to understand simply because we are too stupid. We are doing the best that we can, but there are some thoughts which we cannot think, and there will be questions that we will not be able to even pose. So in that sense, we are very, very limited. But on the other hand, I'm also convinced that the fact that we can do all of these things to some extent, that we have this urge to understand, that we have this inner subjective uh, life in a sense is again also a, 
a fantastic natural phenomenon in itself, which we also will have, I'm sure, very difficult time to understand. So in that sense, we are both limited in the way what we can understand about the universe. I mean, there are beautiful things we have understood. There are lots ahead for science, I'm sure, but we are limited. On the other hand, we are also probably one of the most interesting physical phenomena there is in the universe. So we are both in that sense. You know, one of the reviews, either Publishers Weekly or Kirkus, said, you know, because it's written for the lay reader, and that's what I am. They're saying, oh, it might be a little difficult for the lay reader. But I never thought that because, for example, the chapter, and this goes to what you were just saying, uh, the chapter in which you talk about the self-referential aspect of the human mind in the sense that, um, and, and I, I would like you to explain this, there's three things that I can use as examples. One, the set of all sets that includes itself. Oh, God, that, that's, that, that's a hard one. That's, well, <laughs> we can make it easier because then you have the barber that can only shave people that don't shave themselves. Yes. And then you have, as I said in the introduction, my nose will grow. Explain. I think that's the best one. I love that one. <laughs> well, let's, okay, let's let's stick with that and explain to me and to the lay reader why that self-referential -refer aspect of, yeah, you know, I don't even know which way you go on that. Is it, yeah, explain that to me. I think, you, so what the po important is with why I'm, I'm, I'm referring to this, what, what's the use of it even in the book maybe? Yeah. Yes, I, I think there are, what it, what it tells, what, what, what's important there to me is that it shows that mathematics in itself is not, and I think that's, that's really what Russell also discovered, mathematics is in some sense, it's not, it cannot both be complete and consistent. There is something fishy with mathematics. And it also means that in order to get out of these kind of traps, which this is an example of, you have to be, you have to make choices. You have to make, you have to construct mathematics in certain senses. It's not something which exists independent of our choices and what we, what we want to do with it. And, and, and that's something which to me is a very important message. It's also the fact that it also points towards, I mean, if you look at those chapters, it's not only that, but it also connects to another very interesting feature of mathematics. And that is that you can, you can construct problems that in practice you cannot really solve which are very, very difficult to solve and in practice impossible to solve using the kind of tools which are at our disposal. But a very fascinating thought to me is that there could be physical phenomena. And again, these phys physical phenomena, they don't really care about mathematics, but there could be physical phenomena that if you want to describe them, then you might need to make use of mathematics, which is that difficult, so difficult that we might not in practice be able to solve the equations. Okay, so Pinocchio is nice. So, so that's 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 some that that's sort of another angle angle to it. Well, you spend some time with it, so to make sure everyone, you know, it's it's kind of arcane but so Pinocchio's nose if he says it grows and it grows he's telling the truth which means his nose shouldn't be growing yes exactly and, and you so see that and you see that I, I, I mean to make I mean you could make a very long story about this but I think that the again the main point that I tried to make which is an old one goes back to Russell and Gödel and so on and that is that mathematics is not as simple as we might have wanted to. We have, if you think about physics and mathematics, I mean, the, the lay person 
would ha usually have a very get a very mechanistic impression. They think of mathematics yes, just yes, counting. It might be difficult, but it's some kind of a rather mechanistic thing which just happens. And physics described by these mathematical laws is, is probably the same. But the point is that that mathematics in itself has in in a sense um, de deficiency mathematics is imperfect it didn't really live up to the standards of someone like bertrand russell which was of course a big disappointment in a sense to him and i think this is an important thing to keep in mind if you want to set an equal sign between the laws of physics, mathematics, and the, and the world itself, the real world. Then, of course, some people like Max Tegmark will see this as, as some kind of an asset, because that if, if the world is mathematics and mathematics is as difficult, as much more difficult than Bertrand Russell thought, maybe that's a good thing because that makes it makes our world uh, a kind of a, a better and more interesting place so you can you can twist this in in, in many different ways but um, yeah that that's well, that, that's that's part of the that's part of the things that the part of the story i wanted to tell well not to belabor the point but it's eloquently stated in your book you know if you look at alan turing who contributed so much to the world and was treated so badly, be that as it may, um, the Turing machine, this concept that there's a machine that could be big yes. enough that could actually replicate, again, it's self-referential. So are you, are you stating that this, this tendency to look at things self-referentially and uh, again, what, Bertrand Russell thought he was not doing, but ended up doing, it hurts my head. Um, <laughs> I'm not as smart as you. And so, so uh, the, well, the easiest way is just to ask you to explain to my readers and listeners. Let me, okay, let me, I, I, think, I think that you, I know what you're after. And uh, okay, a Turing machine, it's basically an ordinary computer, you must say, might say. And a problem in our time, I would say, is that problem in any time is that you have a tendency to take the most modern kind of invention or mechanical thing, machine that you have, and use that as, as a metaphor for the world or for yourself. You go back to the 19th century with steam engines, clockwork, whatever, uh, real machines. And then you might think that the world is a machine like that and the human body is a machine of that kind. Nowadays, the Turing machine or the computer is sort of the metaphor of what the world, the universe might be like a computer. We might, our brains might be just like computers and so on. And here, this really connects back to what I was trying to, to argue. The Turing machine is limited. There is mathematics, which is beyond a Turing machine, which you can prove cannot be handled with a Turing machine. And then the question is whether the actual real world is limited to phenomena that can be captured by Turing machines or not. This is called the Church-Turing hypothesis. And for me, it's obviously so that there is no reason why that should be the case. Uh, who are we to put limits on what, what the world or the universe can be and can do? So therefore, for me, it's clear that there should be phenomena that cannot be captured by Turing machines, what we call ordinary computers. This is very likely to have to do with, with the self-referential 
aspects of mathematics which goes beyond really what Turing machines can can handle. And I'm quoting a theoretical biologist towards the end of the book, uh, Rosen, which wrote the book with a title, which is, is no accident that the title is similar to that title of my book. It's called Life Itself, Robert Rosen, Life Itself. And he claims in that book uh, that exactly that kind of self-referential uh, mathematics even, in terms of physical laws, is what would be needed in order to understand biological life and, of course, then also even consciousness, but even just biological life. That book is uh, that he wrote is one of the probably most difficult books that has been written on these subjects. And, and I also quoting a, a mathematician who, who, who writes about that and, and, and basically says that this is a book that will be hated by biologists and philosophers and everybody because it, it's so different from what everybody else is, is saying. I was fascinated by that book. I didn't understand most of it either, but I was fascinated by it. And I sincerely think that there is something there, maybe in that book, some, maybe somewhere else, which points to something which we are lacking in our understanding of physics and in particular biology. What that is, I don't know. But uh, I think that we have a very limited view of what the world is. And we can partly blame that on that we are using uh, the wrong metaphors for what the world is. We are using these machine metaphors and believe that that's the only way that the world can be. And I really think that there is a fundamental difference, and this I agree with Rosen, there is a fundamental difference between, mach between machines and uh, the organic world. And if I can be a more, bit more philosophical here, I even think that that's the reason behind many of the problems, not the scientific problems, but problems at other levels in our world, that we tend to not only think of other human beings as, to some extent, machines, but also the, the living organic world. We do not appreciate the difference between that and the machines that we can construct and understand. And that I think that's behind also uh, why we are not taking care of the planet in the way that we should. Well, it's so funny it goes that... deeply, much more deeply philosophically than just sort of speculations about uh, scientific progress. You use the word philosophy and philosophical in, in your explanation here. And then that made me think of David Chalmers. You're a cosmologist. He is a philosopher. And when we discussed and we argued, you know, it's reality plus, you know, the plus is there. And he's arguing that, you know, when you put on your, and you talk about it, when you put on your little three, your, your virtual goggles, he's saying that that is a reality. And I'm like, I've said, no, it's not a reality. You have to get up. You have to go to the bathroom. You have to eat. It has nothing to do with reality. He's arguing yes. that it's a reality. It's not a reality. At least to me, it's not a reality. I agree. I agree. And I think that a problem now for us, in fact, I think that that worldview where you are not careful with making a distinction between the real world and the virtual worlds, that's one of the big dangers, actually, in our present times. And my book is, again, trying to argue that we should take the real world a little bit more seriously. I mean, it's strange that you have to say that, but that, that's really, that, that's, that's an important message. And uh, I think it's important that I, as that, that I'm the, 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 the sort of author here, 
is a theoretical physicist, which is used to think about all sorts of crazy things. And nevertheless, I tell you that, no, look here, there is one real world here. We have to sort of take care of that. We have to understand that that's where we are and that that all of these other virtual ideas, virtual realities or beautiful ideas and all, all sorts of things, they are not, they are just that. But that there, is, there is a core here, a real world, and we are in the middle of it. Yeah, and the problem is that virtual reality is now part of our day-to-day -day quotidian existence. Absolutely. The nice, and the nice thing about, about you, for example, and David Chalmers or Douglas Hofstetter is that in the world today, there's, gosh, every day, you realize there's no civil discourse. And because mm -hmm. of that lack of civil discourse, progress can't be made. Whereas with you and David, or Douglas Hofstetter, you're nice to each other. You may disagree. Yes. yes. It doesn't make such a big difference, doesn't it? Yes, I, I think so too. Absolutely. I mean, it's so, I mean, you can discuss things which mean something to you, uh, but uh, even so, you can listen to the other and the argument. And in fact, one thing which I think is is really I think that's the, the core of the scientific attitude. And it's, it's not easy to live up to it, but if you're discussing with someone and you get an argument back, the way that you should interpret that, that argument is in the best possible way. You should help the one you're discussing with, even if you have a different point of view, to formulate the best argument possible against your own your own point of view that is how you should you should work you should try to to make you should try to improve your opponent's arguments help to do that and in that way you can sort of engage in something which you're working together to improve each other's arguments and then you don't know where you will end up i mean that might mean that you eventually also you you are risking something you risk discovering that you were wrong and then you would have to change your mind but that, that's the kind of attitude that you have to have and uh, of course you can do that and have a lot of fun because in some sense you're working together i mean you're playing a game together which you both enjoy and uh, yeah fun is a, the basis i think for a lot of what scientists do the problem with the world as your world, my world, is that whether it's the Ukraine or the death penalty or in America, abortion, there's no civil discourse. So no. <clears throat> if I was arguing abortion and I'm pro-choice with someone who's pro-life, I, I would push forward their argument so that I could, yeah, exactly what you said. But that's yeah. not gonna, that's not gonna sell your book. We're off, <laughs> we're off topic. But I will, in conclusion, I think one of the most important things I took away from your book, and I, I'm thinking, oh, you talk about God a lot. So I was thinking, wait a minute, maybe he's going to end up saying God exists. <laughs> and then that would explain everything, because wouldn't it be nice to have faith and then every all of this is solved? And I kept thinking, maybe he's going there because you talk about God, mm. never. So where does God? if he, she, it, or Einstein's God, where does that fit into your thoughts? Because he's, it's a word that you use several times in the book. Mm. Yeah, uh, someone who's wanting to find God towards the end of the book will be very disappointed when seeing the epigraph in front in the, in the at the end chapter by Marlene Haushofer. Yeah, no, I think that to, to me, and I, I must say that again, I've been discussing a lot with uh, various uh, re religious uh, people as well. And my discussions are often a little bit different than those involving like Richard Dawkins and others. And uh, that's probably because I'm at least trying to have a somewhat more humble uh, uh, angle on everything. And 
to me, I think the most important sort of contribution I can come up with is, is that it's not, it's not dangerous not to know things. In fact, as a, as a theoretical physicist, there are so many things that I'm clear that I don't know. And uh, I'm perfectly fine with not understanding what this universe that I'm a part in, what, what, what it actually is. I, I don't expect to, to find out during my lifetime. But I still feel a kind of, uh, I feel so a connection with the with the the material world in the sense that I I'm part of it and I find it meaningful to to be a part of of this universe and be a part of the natural history of the of the earth I feel a kind of a belonging to all of that and the only thing I can really come up with as a kind of alternative to this need in believing in this God which exists outside of the world and it is, is sort of taking care of us is this feeling of a belonging to the natural world, not feeling that I'm different from the material world. It's something which I which is a, which is an enemy to me or anything like that. It's a feeling of belonging which I can also sense when I look at the night sky full of stars, then I don't feel that this is something which is dangerous to me or alien in a way. I, I just feel the sense that, okay, this is, this is the universe. I'm a part of it just as much as these stars. And that gives me some kind of a comfort and meaning. That's sort of where I end up. Yeah. And that might not be enough for 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 many people, but it's 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 oh, it's more or less enough for me. When you were younger and you realized what you were interested in, and you did your first program with that chess program in basic, <laughs> um, what do you think led to this? I'm going to call it yearning. I don't know if it's the right word. This yearning, this this desire to be a part of this, this desire that you have to belong. Why do you have that? Why do you have this desire? What gives rise to this desire to belong to something, to a universe that's either tending towards something? What is it that you, you say comfort? Why is it comforting? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. I mean, it's... I mean, for me, the reason, I mean, I, I, I got interested in all of these things, it's just curiosity. I mean, it's curiosity, curiosity driven. And, um, and uh, when I get my curiosity satisfied to some extent, and then I got further questions, which lead even further away, I, 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 I sense, I get a sense of meaning. So it's 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 just the kind of thing I find meaningful. I mean, I I, I it it's it's per, part of my personality, and it's something which connects into the way that I grew up, obviously. So it's, I mean, it's it's part of my my life story. I mean, who who I am and uh, what my parents taught me and and, and whatever. So I. I I'm not sure I can give any any other explanation. I mean, it's just it's just something that satisfies me, and I I can easily imagine that other people will have a different angle and everything. And and uh, I of course think that the, the worldview that I have developed through my life have something true to tell about the world but I again I, the only thing I can give you is is myself as an example and then there might be other people who think that okay that there might be something here that I can pick up and 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 use as part of of of, of my view of the world and then then I would be happy happy with that I, I cannot say much more than that well I'm similar I always thought that I'm here <clears throat> 
And the best thing I could do with my life is to gain as much information as I could about what's yeah. going on. What and else so could I, you do? Yeah, and that's <laughs> taking the concrete world and bringing it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But then you do this, and I'm wondering why you did this. You put a picture of Descartes' skull. <laughs> and so you and you say, okay, here's all this. It's not there anymore. Where did it all go? And so you have the sense of comfort, but when you die, unless there is a multiverse and you just are alive somewhere else, when you die, all of that's inside, that yearning, that comfort, all that, yes. where'd it go? Yeah. I mean, I think this this is this is very difficult, of course. Um but I think that again, if you if you take a step back and try to look at this, not only from a not from a scientific point of view, but maybe from a point of view which is not so attached to our time and the way that you view ourselves. We live in a time which is really very, very individual. And the only thing which counts is sort of the individual. But maybe that is not the way that you necessarily have to look at things. Maybe one shouldn't take oneself so seriously. Maybe that's the key. Maybe it's maybe the 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 the, the world, uh, the, the earth and the universe is is more important, and you're a part of that too. And maybe it doesn't matter too much if if you disappear. Uh, the fact that you have once lived and is part of all of this will still give some meaning. I mean, of course, this is just words. I mean, from someone who doesn't believe in God and trying to construct some kind of a meaning. But I, I sincerely believe, nevertheless, that uh, that it, it makes sense. And I'm, I'm trying to 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 make make it so that it makes sense to me. So well, I, I think it's it's something to do with, with with that that we are viewing a little bit too focused on ourselves well, as individuals. We have to end, but the thing about it is, is that going to what you're just saying now, we could talk for an infinite amount of time <laughs> about this. And the thing about yeah. it is, if it is indeed a solipsistic universe, one of us has been very entertaining. I just don't know which one. <laughs> But any in any event, thank you so much all for doing this. I, I, the book is great. I I think that normally I say, oh, what do you want your readers to take away from this? But it's so apparent that it. What's uh, unique about the book, I would say, is that you you state the way you think very clearly, but you yes. also bring in everybody else's thought process or theory. And I think that was the the most generous thing about the book. Yeah, I think that that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to be very clear with that, what I what I believe, and trying to explain a little bit why yes, as well. You did a very good job. Thank you okay. so. Much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.